All right, so welcome everyone to our Learn It at Lunch. And so with us today is Dave Bienemann, and he is the Municipal Arborist for the City of Hamilton. And today he's going to be talking about benefits of trees. Okay, so if you want to start off there, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide today and Miami University and Chelsea asking me to participate. It's always fun. And it's amazing now I've been doing this for 30 years. You don't think about it, but I've hit the plateau of whenever I visit relatives in Iowa, Illinois, or here in Ohio, the first thing they do when I pull in is go, hey, Dave, I have a tree you want to look at. And you, you have no idea. I just go, I'm on vacation. But that's okay. So we're going to talk about the benefits of trees and we'll be start out generic and then we'll kind of work our way into the meat and potatoes. So here we go. We're going to have fun. Okay, here's Hamilton. Do you remember this, Chels? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long before you and I were here, but here's a picture of some tree-lined streets. I can see some horses and buggies in Hamilton, some bicycles. And by the way, those lights still exist in the downtown area. They've obviously replaced them with replicants, but those lights, these street lights, if you take a look, you can see one here with the, looks like a bunch of little bulbs or trees. That's cool. Nice. Do you know what street that is? Oh, back here? Yeah. Oh, that's over there about, I want to say it's like, uh, shoot, two blocks down. That I'm I, I should know I had this, but I want to say it's around North 3rd Street, maybe, North 2nd okay. Street. Now, okay. this is over in Dayton Lane area, and some of these, most of these trees are gone, of course, but you can see what it was back in the day. Just talking about tree line streets where you go down and there's trees on both sides. Now, of course, this is pre underground utilities, right? This is back when they fought the gas was up in the lights. Like you see the light on the picture on the left. So we'll go here and again, just some more streets. You can kind of see how it was back in the day. Just to give you an idea. I there's Dayton Street and the old Mercy Hospital right back in the background. Here we go. All right, so the big thing right now is is what, what the trees do to make our lives better in the community here. And obviously, they cool things off for the streets in the city. They uh, help us with UV rays from the sun. They provide food. You know, we get nuts, fruit. They heal, reduce violence. Now you say, how does that happen? Uh, they've done studies out at Washington State University where the trees cause people to calm, breathe fresh air, and they're more relaxed. They drive slower and create economic opportunities. If you look at a tree lined area and the people want to be in that area when it's desolate, no trees, people want to have a part of it. Of course, increase property values and uh, save water. Good stuff, right? So take a look. We've got our, got our little uh, chestnuts up there. We've got our water. You can see the lake and, of course, our peaches, all things we trees help provide and protect. This is always a good chart. Let's take a look at it. You can find it on the Arbor Day Foundation. So you see your home with all the nice trees around it, but out there you see the big power line. And the power line is, um, I'll move you, Chelsea. I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but there we go. <laughs> I just moved you over. Okay, and plant the right tree in the right place. So what does that mean? Typically under power lines, they're up at about 40 feet tall where the wires are on top, the high voltage. And so in that area, you wanna plant trees that are small, red bud, dogwood, crab apple, some of the smaller maples like paper bark maple. And then that's in that first 20 feet from the pole line or between the street, say the curb and the street right there, you see where the person is. And then once you get over about 20 feet away, you can go into the medium trees that grow up to 40 feet or less. Then of course, once you get to 50 feet away from a line, you can plant those taller trees to provide good benefits. And remember, the larger the tree, the more benefits they provide. Okay, here we go. Here's just something that they're doing out in Los Angeles. They're paving their streets and rooftops white, and that helps reflect the UV rays. And of course, they've in uh, along with planting trees to help reduce energy costs. But I thought that was kind of interesting that that's what they're doing, so you don't have that big reflective heat island. Okay, so I think this is funny. Love, love fruit. 
fact. Gazing at trees, even through a window, while you're at work, lowers anxiety anytime, says Toyota, to Toto Medical University. And you've heard of forest bathing, where they say to go out in the woods and breathe the fresh air of the trees, and you're out there, and they give off butasols, and that, you know, that's something they want to try here in the United States. Okay. How do they help the environment? Obviously, combat climate change, and you've heard many communities or many areas want to plant millions or trillions of trees. They help prevent water pollution, oxygen, they uh, clean the air, prevent soil erosion, horse canopy, wildlife habitat, and, and conserve energy. And then and you can see the city, you can see the roots of some trees, how they pattern out. And of course, there's a forest, looks like in the shape of lungs with some water in it. Looks pretty cool. And then, of course, all these things that you get without trees. I mean, when it's super drought, you get the fires. We get the flooding like down. They get down south, especially with the hurricanes. And then up north, you know, we got the polar bears. And of course, we got our deer here in town that we see. Oh, here's a very important thing. How one species of tree impacts the forest. Um, so we're going to talk just real lightly, chestnut blight with American chestnut, Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer. Chestnut blight was imported over from Asia. They brought it over. Now think of this. When they brought it over, there were 4 billion chestnut trees. And of course now they're all gone except for a handful. And uh, matter of fact, Kelsey, who formerly worked here as an intern in the city, we're actually working with the American Chestnut Foundation and we actually have a research plot here and we're planting chestnuts from the American Chestnut Foundation. And again, they've been working on it for 50 years and the trees are about 85% resistant. Dutch elm disease that was imported through pallets of furniture in Cleveland, Ohio. And again, 4 billion elm trees and what happened? Wiped them all out. I can tell you this is a true story. We had a hundred foot tall American elm in my yard of my house in Iowa, and it was about 100 foot wide. It was huge. I'll bet the circumference was probably 15 feet. And I remember I was five years old when they were cutting it down. That was a long time ago, by the way, 50 years ago. And uh, I said right there and then I have to become a forester to save trees and preserve them or plant them or whatever I got to do after that happened. True story. And then, of course, emerald ash borer again came over on a pallet, started up in Detroit, worked its way into Ohio. And I think right now it's in 28 states. And again, 4 billion ash were impacted. And right now there's research going on how to preserve and save the ash. And of course, the American elms, you can plant those now today, but it takes quite a long time. So insects and disease impact the native forest, and it does cost millions of dollars um, in damage or removal and replanting. That's why, you know, when they say not to introduce a non-native, We've got some trees that were non natives that are currently here. So, for example, um, oh, shoot. Uh, I'm trying to think like Siberian elm, uh, Norway maple, some of those trees that are from a foreign country but are naturalized here, like the honeysuckle. We see the honeysuckle that's around here. And uh, so that's really important. I think I even got down honeysuckle. Now up north in Toledo, where I came from, our honeysuckle is tiny and very hardly any. Now down here, it's huge. It's amazing how much honeysuckle is down in this part of the state. I'm amazed. Here we go. Sorry. There we go. Gypsy moth. Now for all of you, if you think of the state of Ohio and we cut it in half and go from Toledo down toward Athens, that's primarily where the gypsy moth is and they attack oaks, but there's really about 20 species. So here's a tree that defoliates. I used to go out the Pennsylvania Turnpike out toward Philly, and you just see tree after tree devastated. So what they're doing with the gypsy moth right now is they are spraying to slow the spread and to slow it down. They use BT, bacterial thuringiogenesis, and it's you know natural in the soil. But again, that's very good on like certain days. But yeah, gypsy moss really an impact. Okay, Asian longhorn. Oop, I apologize. Asian longhorn beetle are, uh, how shall I say, they were found in a pallet down here in this area in Claremont County over by um, Bechtel, I think. And they're slow moving. Where emerald ash borer could move 25 miles like in a week. 
These guys don't hardly move too fast, and they're primarily attack red maple, but they attack all maples and about 20 other species. So right now it's contained to Claremont County, but it's over in Bethel, and I want to say a couple of townships like by one of our state parks. And again, this is why it's critical about not moving firewood, especially with all the pests with our pests with our native um, our trade that we have. And of course, emerald ash borer. I formerly worked in Bowling Green. I I did a research project with Ohio State University, Michigan State, and Purdue entomologist plant pathologist for eight years, where we studied uh, all the native species of ash, and of course the Chinese ash, the Manchurian ash, and the Excelsior ash from Europe. And the, the thing is, it's from Asia and Europe, so obviously those trees are more resistant. So right now they're trying to do like the chestnut, where it's going to ultimately be. 1 16th Asian ash, which has a resistant gene, and then 15 16 North American. But again, emerald ash borer has pretty much devastated all the ash in Ohio, and I think it's in 28 states right now, and it's going to continue marching on. Now, the question is, it's marched through Ohio, it's marched through Michigan and since about 2000. So the question is, are they still around? Yes. Uh, researchers went back, trees that were passed over or missed, they go back and now they're being attacked. There, there's a low population, a low pest pressure, but they're still still in play. All right, let's take a look kind of at the forest ecosystem. And this is going back to college classes a long time ago. I see producers, scavengers, primary consumers, decomposers, ditchers, feeders, secondary consumers. So, so you can tell the impact the forest has and what's happening. So uh, I can tell you this, my oldest daughter uh, got her uh, bachelor's degree at Bowling Green in biology and emphasis in plant ecology. And now she's at Ohio State doing a master's in plant health science. She did a study on where how the removal of ash trees has impacted the forest ecosystem. And it was showing how databases like honeysuckle and garlic mustard and all this stuff were filling in. And it was disrupting the forest ecosystem everything involved like in this picture. So again, just one species that we lose, okay? And uh, so you can see how do trees help with wildlife? They provide food, they provide shelter, cover, and all kinds of stuff. And of course, when the trees decay, that helps the decomposers and promote healthy soil. Now we'll talk about the jump in soil Asian worms another day, but I see that's a picture there, okay. Fallen trees, snags, and of course they're important, I want to say in a natural setting or in parks. But one thing we have to keep in mind, if you live in a city and there's targets, cars, people, place, or things, that's where you have to go, well, it's a dead and dying tree, a snag, a wildlife tree. But when it's in an area, high population, or people are walking past, that's where we may have to go in and do some removal or top the tree to make it safe so it doesn't hurt anybody. But they're very important fallen trees and leaves and all the debris. Decaying trees, there's all the different fungi you see. Young trees can sprout from a down limb and they call that a nurse log and the soft tissue. Uh, there's a book by Peter Wollenberg that talks about how trees are interwoven underground and maybe other trees will support a tree that's hurt or other trees will support a stump or the stump may support other trees and provide nutrients. So that's a pretty good read if you get a chance, interesting. And again, all, all the um, good things that decaying trees do. Birds, of course, birds love um, the trees, make nests, shelter. They, there's, I think oaks support four or 500 different kind of butterflies and moths. And, and then you've got all those species that feed on butterflies and moths. So it's really, really important. And there's some different birds and trees, cardinals, prothonary warbler, Chickadee, I think that's an acorn woodpecker. That's more down south, and uh, that's actually like a, a falcon. So <laughs> I got got the wrong bird in there. But blue bluebirds and a barn owl here. Okay. All right, bees and pollinators, and then just other insects. And uh, of course, that's a hornet's nest. Of course, that. <laughs> and over here is probably eastern tent caterpillar. And then our pollinators, insects, amphibians. All these things live in the trees. And uh, there's a book, I wish I could remember the name of the top of my head, I can't, but it's about the redwoods. 
and how they grow up. And in the upper canopy, you've got salamanders and frogs. It's like a whole ecosystem up of the woods. So this is all very important, especially now with the pollinators that are in danger. The monarchs uh, are, are, are being impacted right now. Of course, all the different animals that get impacted. And uh, obviously, uh, the bears, which I think is cool, and the coons, all kinds of stuff have, they can have habitat or where they, uh, the bears um, uh, migrate, sleep, sleep in in their dens over the winter. Pretty cool. And of course, all kinds of other little guys like this mole. I think the big thing is, is that um, you can, you can see that, like, I've got an example how a bird may do, make a thousand or more trips to transport twigs and grasses to build a nest and just that moles excavate chambers, raise and sleep their families. I think it's just pretty cool how much one tree does uh, provide for the ecosystem. And of course, beavers, fish, and you think about it like over in Pennsylvania with all their cold water streams, and those are below their hemlock forests. And because the hemlock woolly adelgid is killing the hemlocks, it's in, and it's making them die, there's more sunlight, there's less uh, guff layer, it's heating up the ground, it's impacting salamanders, and more specifically brook trout, which need pretty pristine and cool water to survive. So there's a lot of things out there that, you know, trees impact that you don't really think about other than, you know, just, just the forest. And of course, large animals as you go out west. Obviously, we have some, a few black bear, bobcat in Ohio. Of course, the wolves are going to be more up in the Michigan up there in those northern states. Okay, city of Hamilton. Now, this is amazing. Uh, when I got here, we didn't have an inventory. We had a partial and it, they guessed that we had about 6,000 trees back then. Well, we had 14,163 trees between our street trees, parks and two city owned golf courses and some of the public green spaces. Uh, we had 144 different types of trees. Now, the sad part for us is, is that our primary species is calorie pear, which just to let everyone know, as of January 31st, 2023, uh, any flowering pear, this is not fruiting pear, but the flowering pear will be illegal to sell by in the state of Ohio by the Ohio Department of Ag, just to give everybody a heads up. You can see them on 129 in the spring and State Route 75, and just look at any vacant lots here in Butler County or Hamilton, and you'll see all the pear growing up. It's pretty amazing. Silver maple, uh, sweet gum, red maple, hackberry, and of course red oak. Now our white ash at that time was 2.65, but it continues to go down because a lot of our ash have been impacted. The picture here that you see is a nice little, uh, uh, just a little old crab apple there. Okay, here we go. Here's a Canadian red select cherry. You can see that picture over here on the left. But so our age structure is, just to give you an example, 44% of our trees are young, which means they're six inches or less diameter. 21% as established means six to 12 inches. Maturing is 12 to 24, and then mature trees are 24 and greater, about 7%. And the good news is 58% of our trees are were at that time in good condition, another percentage fair, and then of course, dead or dying. But I think the big thing to explain is most of the dead trees, we had 2000 when I got here almost five years ago, we're down to 360, so we're slowly picking away at it. And then our canopy cover here in the city is about 22%. And uh, what is the value of our street trees? Oh, over here on the left, if you can see that picture, it's a uh, red barren crab apple, looks pretty cool. And our total cost of our, if we had to replace our current urban forest that's managed by the city, it'd be 16.4 million. The breakdown is 12 million for street trees, 3.1 million for park trees, and 1.2 million for golf course trees. And then one of the things we're doing to replenish our nursery stock and sustain our urban forest is we are planting 300 new street and park trees, two to two and a half inches diameter breast height, that's four and a half feet off the ground, our planter per year, and uh, that's at a cost of about 350 piece, and that's probably about 22% of my budget a year. And then, of course, we, we spend money on maintenance, pruning, removal, cleanup, and that's approximately 58%, just to give you some numbers. Ready?
And then energy saving, I, there's a picture on, if you can see it on the left here, that's a uh, red bud getting ready to bloom. But I think the big thing is it uh, saves, look, megawatts, about 2,500 megawatts, and then it was, uh, which is about 300,000 a year in electric, and then a savings for gas use of about a half million. And uh, obviously, Ward 1, for those of you, is on the west side, and it's split in half, you know, north of Main Street and south, and that, that's where we have the most trees, so that's where the most benefits are. Ward 2 is over here on the east side. They, at the time, had the least amount of trees, so that's where we're really focusing our efforts. And uh, I think the big thing is we take out almost 3,000 tons of carbon dioxide, and uh, we take out pollution. I think it's like 13.3 tons in air quality. That's taken out nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, ozone, all that good stuff, about 3.1 tons. So the trees are doing a good job of helping us. Stormwater runoff, our trees intercept 24.1 million gallons of water per year. And that's just fantastic. And I think that's a really a big thing. And obviously, to provide benefits, the larger the tree, like a big hackberry versus a little service berry or a little lilac tree, you can tell that's the difference. Uh, that picture there that you see on the left, if you're seeing it, it happens to be a hornbeam, American hornbeam. Okay. One of the big things trees provide is social and economic benefits. So right now, it it adds value to homes, it adds values to businesses to have tree-lined streets. And that's really, really important. And I think the biggest thing is, is that we're planting the trees in the right place, not on top of underground utilities or under big power lines now, and we're doing a lot better. I get support from the city through the tree board, through the council and the mayor and the city administration to help with that. The picture you see on the left, if you can see it, is a Beijing gold lilac, another form of lilac tree. Okay. And management recommendations are, is that we'll continue to fund and do our urban forestry program, that we are planting trees, we're taking care of them through maturity. Uh, we keep working on it. Now, right now, the investment return is for every dollar we spend, we're getting back $3.33. Uh, and that's really good if you think about it. That's a 333% return. Now, the picture on the left, if you can see it on the slide, that is a rising sun redbud. And the leaves come out kind of an apricot color, slowly turn kind of a yellow green to a darker green. It's a pretty darn cool tree, one of my favorites. And uh, new tree establishment. I think right now we're painting about 350 a tree. And by the time we get into it, because we water it and then we get a tree bag for it and all that, you see the tree bags that go up. We probably got $455 per tree invested. So we're looking at $136,500 per year investment in the city of Hamilton. And that's what we're doing. The picture over there is a hedge maple, turns a nice gold color in the fall. Sorry about that. I think it advanced on me. Okay. That's a paper bark maple over there. So I guess I wanna say the big thing is with Hamilton's trees is, is that we have 14,163 trees that are providing almost 6.4 million in benefits. And the canopy covers the driver. So we've really been focused on the east side of the city where we had a lack of canopy or a lack of trees. And we've been really working in the neighborhoods on the east side of the river and that's providing some fruits because I'm, I'm out driving, looking at the trees that we've done over the past five years and they look fantastic. Uh, I wanna show you some recently planted trees to give you an idea, just some cool, we're doing some red bud trials and I know they're still smaller trees, but we have in the older parts of the city, if you look in the picture on the left, between the curb and sidewalk, we have about four feet. So you have to plant smaller growing trees. So the tree on the left is called a rising sun red bud and it gets that apricot yellow to green leaf. Now Mer Merlot red bud, is a red bud that gets kind of that wine color. And then in the fall, it turns a nice fine yellow and so does the rising sun. Uh, paper bark maple is another good tree. It's a four season tree. You got the different bark, different leaves, green and it turns red. Ruby slippers, maple, the uh, Samaras or helicopters for some of you that are older when we grew up. 
they turn a bright red and the leaves are beautiful and then in the fall they turn a nice bright red again another four season tree and again these are trees driven by the smaller right of ways on the east side of the city uh, we have a canadian red select cherry the one with the redder leaves and of course a little bit bigger tree is a brody red horse chestnut and they are real cool uh, trees beijing gold lilac and again ivory silk lilacs are really overplanted in ohio and just everywhere so we've been changing up planting summer charm ivory pillar the the golden uh, beijing golden lilac now another red butt you probably haven't heard of, but we've planted them as silver cloud. And again, it's a variegated, and again, it, it's pretty cool looking tree. Um, now I don't plant a lot of crab out, okay? And they're more for a park area, just cause the fruit's a little messy and the birds eat them and whatnot. That one right there is called a uh, prairie fire crab apple on the left. And then the tree on your right over here is uh, a Yoshino cherry. And, and again, the cherries are, from like the Cherry Festival in Washington, D.C. from China. So there's Kwanzaa and Yoshino accolade. There's a Royal Burgundy Cherry, again, get double flower, real bright red leaves. And of course, there's another red bud, a white red bud. So I, I'm a red bud guy, I like them. Now, a little bit larger tree, Durer Heat River Birch. They're made for tough soils, compacted soils, clay. They can take drought, they, so they're a good tree. Now, Wireless Zocova is a smaller Zocova. And again, a lot of these are insect and disease free, so that's why we choose them. And that's all, folks. So, Chelsea, I'm going to bring you all up. I know it's supposed to go an hour, but <laughs> I was afraid to go too long. So, I, I guess I can open it up to any questions or anything. Yeah, definitely. So, if anyone has any questions for a day, put them in the chat and see if you can answer them. Let's see. I just want to ask. Huh? Yeah. Do I share it back to you, Chelsea, or are we okay right here? I think we're okay from here. Okay. I did want to ask you, Dave. I, I know that during the conference um, last year, they were showing some of the trees and they had those pink pom-pom red buds. Right. I always thought those were interesting. And they said that the, because of the double flower, it reduces the reproduction of them. So it reduces the seed batch that they produce. And I don't know if like, oh. that would be something that would be interesting for the city uh, in addition to with the double flower it being more of a pop. Yeah. Matter of fact, I have a picture one. I don't remember where I took the picture, but I go to other nurseries and I'm trying to remember when I was just at one trying to find it. But what I've been trying to do is look at different varieties. Part of the thing is you have to find nurseries that grow it. And when we go out to contract, if, if our local vendors who bid our projects can get it, like there's, I've seen that one. There's about five red buds I'd like to get my hands on. That's one of them, just to start planting it. But I know yeah. exactly the one you're talking about. Like if yeah. you go to Burns in Middletown or Delhi, they'll carry it. But I, if I want to buy a two-inch caliper one, that's what I. That's our spec. So a lot of them in the nurseries are like as big as your finger. They're tiny. So that's yeah. part of my issue. But yeah, that one's on there. That's a good question, Joe. Cool. Thanks. All right, I got. Abby says, love seeing the variety of trees at the end. Uh, if we wanted to purchase some of these trees, is there a vendor you recommend? Um, I would say the vendor down here that has the most trees species available would be Natorps. They're over there in uh, Mason. Uh, now you could go to Burns, which is up in Middletown off of Sinday Road, just north of Monroe, or Del High, which is off of uh, I'm sorry, let's see, Del High is going to be, Del High is the one off Sunday Road. Burns is off of Main Street uh, as you go. I guess it's the same road. You go north of Monroe, cross 63 to Burns, up toward Middletown, and then Del High is just north of 129, a right, right around Princeton Road and Sunday Road. There's a UDF and Del High. They would have those trees, sure. Right, but if you live in the city of Hamilton and you want a street tree, you definitely can um put in an order for a street tree yeah. Isn't that right, Dave? that's correct so if someone wants a street tree in hamilton they would just get a hold of me or call me and i would come out we have to inspect it determine what's all there there's a few things we have to work around and if there's room for a tree surely we could uh, plant one you know yeah. right but that's only if you have a tree lawn there right. between and Sour Rock and the street. Wide, right four feet wide minimum and then we have to be some distances and clearances from some underground utilities or intersections. But yeah, sure. 
Right. All right. Um, Randy says, any new research into emerald ash borer jumping to new host tree species? No. I've read some research showing some individual white fringe trees are being impacted. Yeah, and, and, and that was two trees. Um, one up by Dayton and one down in Cincy. Uh, Dr. I think it's Don Ciparelli. He's a researcher up at Wright State, and they found one down here. They found two trees it went to, but they actually did trials with the white fringe tree in it. And the only reason it did, they're in the olive family, which is ash, oleacea, but they said it was only two trees and they've done trials with other fringe trees and they don't attack. So it might've been just the fact there's high pest pressure in those areas, but when I've sat through those meetings that no other species and it was just two fringe trees, I think. Okay. Uh, Mark Gilmore says, please discuss DIY tree health care for homeowners. Any elixirs generally useful for all slash most trees, plant growth regulator, soil drench? Holy mackerel. Well, I was one of the guys that did a lot of research on, on plant growth regulators, believe it or not, back in the late 1980s, early 90s. I haven't used that stuff since probably 95. Plant growth regulators were primarily used to contain a tree or keep it small after you pruned it. But I think of pole larding. When you trim a tree, what does it do? It has um, the buds that then take buds and they want to shoot canopy. So we found out using the growth regulator on trees specifically, if they were medium or large growing trees, they really pushed out a lot of sucker growth. So what, I'll just tell you, we got away from it. When I say we, it was back when I worked up in the Akron Canton area, but I, I haven't been too much into that. So I'd have to follow up with uh, maybe somebody at Ohio State to get more information on it. As far as planting a tree, what we do, we plant a tree in year one, it gets watered for two seasons from May to December. We don't actually prune the tree unless there's a broken branch or a problem to year three. We like to give it three years to reestablish the root system and grow, and then we go in and prune it in year three. Then we come back about every five years after that, you know, up until it's probably 30 years old, and then it should be the shape and structure we need it. But that's a good question. That might be another topic for another day. Yeah, but I think... I think for the most part, if you want to keep a tree a certain size, I think the best hallmark probably is to just select the correct tree. You know, putting an oak tree in a four by four area is not going to help you. That's you know, so starting with a small tree, if you want it in a small area, is probably the best way to go. Yeah, exactly. You're going to plant the right tree in the right place. Chelsea's 100% correct. Right. All right. Amy Warren says many nurseries continue to offer trees which are not recommended. Is there any effort on the part of universities, et cetera, to educate the nurseries? Joanne Warren, yeah. Yeah, I, I know that the OSU Extension, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Forestry, we actually have meetings like twice a year well, they actually invite, like we had one down here and we invited all the nurseries from the Dayton, Cincinnati area and talked about root flare and, and the such. And at the end of the day, their business says, so without regulation, for example, Ohio Department of Ag regulation that went into state law is no more calorie flowering pears will be sold after January 31st, 2023. That's really the only way nurseries or Home Depot or Lowe's are gonna stop selling it. I, I don't think they can stop them unless it's a, a law on the books of the state of Ohio. But yeah, and when I go into, Burns and Dell High, I kind of go, you're you're selling that, really? And <laughs> so I do talk to them as well. And here's what I will tell you. The DNR, we recommend City Hamilton, like I'm working with uh, four nurseries here local, two in Fairfield, um, Wilson Garden Center and Lifestyle Landscape Solutions. They've been educated when we've talked about diversity, why we plant different things. Let's take Bridgewater Falls. Let's take Liberty Center Mall. You'll go in and find little leaf linden, locust, some type of elm, red maple, uh, crab apple. I'm just trying to think of what you see. Coneflower, Stelladora, daylilies, knockout. It's the same 20 plants 
and yeah. you got we've got to get out of that and that's I think that's what I've been trying to do when I talk to them and the others. So that's a great question. Yeah. And then the other other aspect is like if you want to do like tree care, you know, you could go to um, like uh, anyone for a tree trimming and it, it could result in just topping the tree, which is the worst thing you could ever do to Absolutely. a tree. So being on top of like people who will just do straight up topping versus someone who actually has a certified arborist in their crew who actually knows what they're doing you know right. that's something to always look and yeah probably it's a little bit more expensive but your tree is going to be healthy and you're not going to kill it off in the you know long run um from topping it and it's not going to look like a lollipop or just like a straight up stick you know from right. just topping it and here's the hardest thing for my job as i try and get the word out down here and i'm just going to pull up a picture i hope everybody can see it but I'm trying to stop this nonsense right here. Yes. I just went by somebody's house and this is this is in, in, in somebody's yard and they paid someone to do this and I'm just showing you pictures of trees in someone's yard. They just paid to have this done and of course they got one of my street trees, but that tree is actually on schedule to come out, but no, they literally, they literally cut the tops out and you can tell if I zoom in on the picture. You can actually tell this is the third or fourth time they've had that tree topped and I'm trying real hard, but I have to walk a fine line is the reach of the government is to provide public education. That's me or Chelsea or whoever out there, but I can't, I can't go in and tell a customer you can't have your tree top, but if it's a, in the public space, that's my domain. But the bottom line is that still happens. And, and like Chelsea said, when you're trimming a tree, I'm going to use my hand. If you trim between your wrist and your arm here, that's topping internodal cut. We're at your wrist, at your elbow, or at your shoulder on the trunk. Those are making proper cuts. And so when you top them like that, it's just a bad day, storm damage, death. I mean, yeah. but it makes it more compared, dangerous. Yeah. So the fact that tree companies do that, and here's what I tell people, if you guys can remember this when it comes to tree work, more pruning like if you're removal or stump draining fire wherever you want because that's easy but trimming if you say hey can you tell me do you follow the ANSI 300 tree pruning standards and if the tree company you hire says what's that that's your answer to use them for pruning that's all i'm going to say ANSI 300 american national standard institute 300 pruning reg and that's what more reputable tree companies use in the ANSI 153. you say Hey, can you you guys use the ANSI 300 printing regs? And they go, I have no idea what that is. You're like, right? Okay. And, and don't go for someone who's like arborish. I've had someone say that they're arborish. <laughs> well, Chelsea and I, we're we're a C and D's tree service. We've been doing it for 35 years. We have no formal training or follow ANSI, but we can trim trees. And then you get that, you get the top tree. That's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there challenges in increasing urban canopy in Hamilton? There seems to be many benefits. I'm wondering if anyone ever um, objects to having more trees. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes. I'll give you an example. We <laughs> we pick 300 locations a year to plant trees, 150 in the spring, 150 in the fall. We actually put letters out three months before we plant the trees and it tells people you can opt out if you don't want a tree. And I think the worst I ever had it is probably 25 people in one spring and fall opted out of a tree. But like this year, we put up 150 in the spring, 10 people opted out. This fall, we're doing 150 trees and only five people opted out. And see, my, my charge from the mayor, council, city manager is not to force a tree on anybody because we have 10,000 open sites, so there's plenty. And so my job is just to get 300 trees in a year and uh, just move forward. So we, we, want, we want to plant the tree where people are receptive. Right, and a lot of times when people reject a tree, it's because they've had a really bad experience um, with a tree. Yes. Um, it's getting down into the gutters and then having to pay thousands of dollars a row to it or the heaving up the sidewalk. Sewer lines, um, fog, exactly. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times, you know, it's 
you know, if it's the sidewalk, it's just the wrong tree in the wrong place, or if it's something like it getting down in the foundation or into the pipes, it's because, you know, really there's already been a crack or a malfunction in the foundation itself. Right. And the tree's really just taking advantage of the water. Like they don't naturally go and seek out a broken pipe or broken foundation. They're just looking for wherever the water's coming through and they take advantage of it. But yeah, a lot of times it's just a really bad experience with that. Yeah. All right. Uh, great news. Thanks. Uh, please remind me, will these slides be available? I didn't take notes on these tree names. Would love to have some red buds enjoying all of the presentation. Yes, so we're recording this. So um, we'll have it available as a recording. I can see about, I think you say it, sent me um, this presentation, Dave. So I can see if we can somehow attach it to our website. So if nothing else, we have the recording. So you can go through and, and get it that way too. Yeah, and if anybody wants a, a list of trees they can plant, um, they, you just provide my email, have them email me and I'll send them our tree list with links so they can actually click on like Rising Sun Red Bud and it'll take, give them information on that. Right, right. Um, any suggestions how municipalities can regulate uh, ragu, ragu tree service companies, uh, rogue, rogue tree service companies that sell tipping and topping of trees? So there really, really isn't much in being able to regulate that, is there, Dave? Yeah, w once it's off public property, it, it's kind of that's the government reaching into private property and you know it, it's a little different with a licensed plumber electrician you know somebody like that that's it's licensed and uh by the state of ohio and there's laws or laws to back up uh it i'll just tell you right now this comes up all over we just we have an issue up north they have oak will up in the cleveland area and a fly by night tree company was going in and topping oaks and they were using tree spikes and they were literally spreading the oak wilt from tree to tree to tree yeah. because they were using spikes so again the city doesn't have a a reach if you will into private property so that that's where it gets a little sticky yeah it's just um, like the tree lawn that you can regulate really yeah, we can regulate like the public public right away parks but yeah once it's on private property it you, you get into you know how far can the government reach it right right you know, we can reach so you, high yeah yeah and with oak well you you never want to trim an oak during the growing season it's only when they're dormant that you ever want to trim an oak. right but, but that's that is a, a good question now what i do just to let everybody know is we do these seminars i usually do four a year of course this year they all got sacked due to COVID. but what i will tell you is is we do educational information on the city's website and when they put out electric bills we try and say don't top trees and really if, like you saw the pictures i just recently took those trees were just trimmed mm -hmm. this week like probably this past weekend i will post that on uh the hamilton lorax is my instagram so if you guys do instagram that's me there's a picture of a lorax but we do ohio tree id where we do one tree every two weeks ohio division of forestry so if you go into ohio tree id on instagram you'll learn about all kinds of trees we started it last year in february of 2019 and we're still going i think we started out with just to give you guys an idea i'll bring it up real quick i think the dnr's goal was 100 followers and i can tell you that we were amazed that we're up over 3600 followers but there's ohio tree id yeah. And you can see the different species. We do leaves, we do bark, we go flowers, we go hot ID the tree. We're doing a persimmon and we just did a dove tree. And so you can go back on that and look at all the species from last year. So two months, so we're doing like 24 a year. It's good stuff. Cool. Yeah, and even if you're doing like home trimming, it's always good to do your own research on like how to properly trim a tree. Cause I just, when I was biking here to work, I looked over and someone had did a pretty good job at trimming a tree, but they didn't do a pre cut up. So when they cut the branch off, the way the branch stripped the bark off of the side of the tree. And so it left a big open wound. It's kind of like if you were going to have your uh, finger amputated and halfway through the skin, the doctor just ripped the rest of the finger off and then like took the skin off the palm of your hand. So it's always good to do your research if you're going to do at least your home trimming. 
um, to see how to properly cut the tree, you know, branches off, you know, pre-cut at the bottom and then cut off the rest and then do the rest of the cut. So that's nice and flush and it's not cutting into like the collar of the tree either so they can then properly heal. So it's always good to do research. And on yeah. our city's website, Chalice under Hamilton Urban Forestry, additional resources, I've got 30 pages of stuff and one of it's on for with all those proper cuts and pictures. So if people Fantastic. want to jump on there. Uh, certified arborists are the answer no matter what the question is. Uh, my cousin in Missouri says he can't fix stupid. Yeah, and, and, and believe me when I say this, there there's tree companies out there that are fine for removal, stump grinding, stuff like that, storm cleanup. But, you know, if they're going out there and doing this to a tree, it's just, it just tears me up. Now, one thing I will tell you, I'm from Northern Ohio, and then I'm down here now. I noticed that from here all the way over to Athens, they like to top trees and do that type of trimming. I just see it like in Gallipolis and, you know, down there, that's over there in Jackson, Vinton County. I, I just see it down in this way. And I, maybe that's a thing from the past they used to do. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. we're doing the best we can to get the word out, at least trying to. Yeah. And I think it's just all about the correct education and people being willing to, you know, accept that education and execute it, you know. And, you know, I, but at the same time, I think a lot of time it's price wise, you know, but I don't know. I wouldn't generally want a top tree, you know, in my yard, you know, especially knowing that it actually would cause the tree to be more dangerous because of the, you know, the, the, the branches that are then generated aren't very strong. So you right. get more issues. Like I've had um, my grandmother's tree was pretty much topped. And then from that point on, ever since I was always out there picking up the, the branches that fell off and they were constantly dead big giant dead branches in there. So it's like it caused more trouble than it was to, to just left the tree alone. Cause then you just pick up stuff all the time. I'm just trying to pull back in my, uh, you know, this stuff. Like, I don't know who all can see the screen. I'm gonna try and pull up the tree poster. Yeah, and I see. We have, I see we just, yeah, I, I just pulled up, yeah. we just created a fifth poster, which is on Fungi, diseases, and insects. It's pretty cool, and we'll have it available probably in January. But this it's tree uh, black right now. Can you see it? Not yet. It's uh, black. Oh, hold it's on. So on your screen. I can do here. I got a. Here we go. All right, I'm trying. Are you, are you, am I back to you? Back here. Uh, so there you go. I see. There it. you go. Okay. What I was trying to do is get this tree poster to pop up, and that's what I'm trying to load up. It's just to see if you can see it pop up for those that brought up, you know, looking for trees. It's a big file, so I apologize. It seems like it's taking a little bit of time. There, so it's, it's a huge file. Posters on five posters. She's probably lost her mind by now. Right. <laughs> is it there, it's here. There it is. Can you see it? Oh yes. Yeah, I don't know if people out there they can see, but that's yeah, all the different types of trees I talked about, and they can use a. Now, for those of you QR code, you know it's called quick response is what that means, and then you just get a QR reader and you hit it on there, it goes bling, and it'll take you out and tell you all about the tree. Yeah, most smartphones have them, so you can pretty easily like bring it up. Most of them already have it installed. If nothing else, you can go to your app store and download one. Um, but you know, it just reads it real quick and then pops up the, the information for you. Yeah, I, what I was trying to find was um, the other thing on, I think I have something Chelsea. I'm just trying to remember if it was on, you know, different questions on here. See, it says, ask a question, yeah. just basic questions. And like I said, I think there's stuff on tree planning, uh, what, you know, all this good stuff, butterflies, I'm just going in, there's Ohio tree ID, et cetera, et cetera. Do you still call also, yep, go ahead. The, the, what I was working on where it had uh, the Davy system worked into it and then uh, could show all the different trees around the yeah. city and then information on each species. Yeah, we actually have an app. Let me go back to the front page here. Let's see, this is like the home page. Now the home page, there's 
and just real quick as election pruning other program up towards that you see that oh we did a follow tree there's a printing app there's a how where to go we do have something else that shows where the trees are you know the different trees yeah it, it was right there there's a tree planting app oh we did we added the fall colors but i think in the educational research and then it does that i'll just have to find it we're in the process of updating this again that's what i'm looking for but there is a there is actually an app that says where are the trees and it's called the tree finder app but i'm going yeah, I, I where did they, oh here it is hamilton tree on it so what it does is the art gis so you can go in for any tree in the public area parks or the golf course and you punch in your address or you can hold your phone and go and it should you click on it but this is taking some time i don't want to get away from the questions though if there's any more sorry about that i, I can not see me right now but we okay we but you could see this so on the tree finder there's the city and the trees will pop up and it, then it just says, oh, do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to check my, it gives you instructions. Mm -hmm. And this will pop up on your, you can pop it up on your phone from that application. And then you can go in and, you know, do whatever you want to do. It's actually pretty darn cool if you think about it. Yeah, so, that's really nifty and handy. So you can go in there, like it says, click a standing person, click my location, or click the home button. But ultimately, tree finder app, you can find any tree in the public right away that we have of the 14,163. Yeah, so this is cool yeah, and especially useful if you're doing like uh, the the leaf books, like I know a lot of elementary school students do, you know, if you're looking for a specific tree or trying to figure out, wait, what's this tree that I'm looking at and I need this leaf, that's definitely handy for that because I know when I was doing it, you know, that's mm -hmm. way to do that was to go to like the Oxford and look at the trees with like the tree wrap and stuff like that but if it's like right here in the city you need to make a, a leaf book that's pretty useful for that tree this is our so let me click that and i'm going to see if i can get out, out of here a second oh, God. there we go and i think there's a way okay where's it at here oh, God. there's a way up here on then my little screen there's i can't i got too big a screen to push the button hey that fall colors allows you to you know do stuff so it's cool there we go there we go get chelsea back but all right i don't gonna i'll bomb this off real quick but there's lots of stuff there if people are bored and <laughs> you know what i'm saying i'm gonna get back the chair back to you chelsea so let me get it back to you if i can if anyone else has any more questions or comments, you can put them in definitely in a, in a chat for Dave. We've got about seven minutes still left. Okay. I got to remember here. There we go. Share. All right. So I'm sharing my screen, even though it's blue. But uh, yeah, no, today was a good day. I'm glad everybody was available. Like I said, Chelsea, if you want to email them my email or if they want information, I'd be glad to provide it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I'll see about putting the, the slides with the um, recording so you can put that on our web page. Yeah, if you got to make it a zip file or something. Uh, I got a um, question here. Are there any workshops slash efforts in Hamilton around trees and for permaculture and food forests? Wow, that's that's something I'd have to check with OSU, OSU Extension. So Butler County OSU Extension kind of does those type of things. So you'd have to go on their page and check because they that's kind of in their wheelhouse. Yeah. On that, Alfred Hall might have some things on definitely like um, with regards to maybe food forests because he does a lot with the gardening and things like that. Um, but yeah, probably OSU does a little bit more. Yeah. When I when I get the updates from OSU Extension and that's the whole state, I mean that's where I see those type of classes. Yeah, definitely. You know, Warren County probably might have some on that too. Yeah, because their office is in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You remember Cindy Meyer? That's where she works now. She was formerly here in Butler. Ooh. All right. Nice. Okay. Have a thank you. You got any more in cast? So you good. All right. So are you guys coming up with any contingency plans if Lantern Fly makes it this way? Well, I, I'll be truthful. I'm more concerned about Asian Longhorn Beetle since it's 45 miles to the south uh, east of here. And yeah. again, so what we're doing is doing the the 2030 rule no more than 10 percent of a species 20 percent of a genus and 30 percent of a family so i just did a landscape review they're going to be putting in new homes and you'll know where this is up on north washington boulevard next to the freshman school there's that yeah. 28 acres in an l they're going to put homes in there they'll be planting hundreds of trees on campus and in the right of way but you know they have all I can say is I, I changed the species content because they were going to put in red maple, linden, locust. It was the standard five. And so I put in like Kentucky coffee tree and black gum and, you know, really changed it up to put go from five species to say 10 species. But instead of 20 species, you know, times five is 100. We went to 10 species, so more than 10. So if we do get a bug or a disease, it only takes out maybe a tenth of the population, rather than like emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, where you wipe out the whole place. Right, right. And like they're recommended not to plant Colorado blue spruce right now because they're getting pine needle cast and they're getting um, the cyclospora canker. And because yeah. when they come in the wild, they grow apart and there's space and the wind blows and there's air. Now here. We plant them close together because we're on a screen and when they touch, there's that moisture bearing to the wind keeping them dry. So right. they always got that moisture. So that supports those diseases. And then the spider mites pass it from tree to tree to tree. So they're even saying getting away from Norway spruce, like maybe plant white spruce, plant uh, black hill spruce, something else or change it up. But plant them wider apart in pockets rather than like five feet apart or 10 feet apart, like plant them. 20 feet apart so they'll grow but they don't touch so you get air in there to mm -hmm. keep the pest production down because that's that's an issue across the state of ohio right. colorado blue spruce in norway getting those diseases right unless you just want to plant red cedar you know right those are nice native those are good <laughs> yeah no those are fine i'm just saying going back to the standard planning if you go to bridgewater falls or right pretty or these uh, where they plant I call it development plantings. It's always the same stuff. Burning bushes. Right, right. Just a monoculture of everything. Right. Now, this is a good crew. We'll have to do it again, right? Right. Yeah. If anyone's got any last burning questions, you got about two minutes. But if not, that's okay. I'm more of, hey, it was good. Yeah. Those were good questions today. Yeah, those were really good questions. Get the first screen question. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, and I and I look for this Zoom, like we've been doing tree board since back on May. I look for us to be doing Zoom probably through at least through the summer. I mean, obviously when they roll out the vaccine and people start getting it. So I'm sure we'll just have to set up some Zoom classes and maybe we can partner again next spring, Chelsea. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, if you have anything you wanna I can definitely post it for you guys. Yeah, maybe we can do like a spotted lantern fly. I think it'd be maybe a combination with Asian longhorn beetle. I can get oh, yeah, to or, or somebody from OSU or extension to help us. That would be definitely great. Okay. Some more thank yous. Okay. Some conversations. Hey, okay, good deal. Okay. Have we hit the magic time? Yeah, I'll stop the recording now. Okay, that's fine. Well, thanks for having me.